Ladies and gentlemen, here is Friedemann Karek. Great. It just works so good. Come again. On love. To love? To love. Um die Uhrzeit um 19 Uhr darf man das, this ja, kind of time I'm allowed to do this because at 7 p.m. it's like at 10 p.m. in the TV it's when we can start with dirty stuff children are in bed now it's the journalists who can write uh, what we are doing here and first before I tell you a true love story I'll, I'll do a little selfie because it's my my first time a ah, dream a dream so there we go Now, if the remote works. Ah, there we go. I tell you a true love story of Paul and Janina. In a summer night seven years ago, a boy meets a girl. It's late, the club is full. They are talking, dancing, drinking, and they are kissing. He asks, do you go to me at my house? She asks, okay, but I don't want to know who, how, how, what your name is, and I don't want to tell you my name. Something behind, between them, magical feeling, electrizing. That's madness, says Paul, as he, he sees her in his bed, and in his, he goes through her bag, and he finds her ID, Jelena, born in St. Petersburg. Two years later, they move into their first apartment. Two weeks later, she's pregnant. She's too young to be a mother, she thinks. Too, too young for rules, so they have make a pact. They want to be a dream team. Unbeatable. A dream team, but not exclusive with each other. They want to have adventures. As long as it's just sex, it's allowed, but not with friends. And we tell everything if the other one asks. And this is an open relationship. She's 21, he's 27, and their son a few months. Seven years later, they told me their story. It's a story about love and letting go, freedom, sex, love, and how these two fit together with jealousy and how not to be defeated by it, and power, of course. Maybe others will learn something about this, says Jelena. It hurt her much, says Paul, but it was great. For me, it was the greatest uh, form of love. For my book, I interviewed Paul and Jelena and a lot of other people who are loving free in some kind of way. The classical form of relationships I wrote down and I researched a bit, talked a lot of tech talks and went through strange forums and stuff. I learned a lot about how and why we love and not in the other way. And I say, well, sadly, the monogamic mainstream, like me, is pretty allergical to this kind of persons. The people in the book and me has been told sick, dumb, and liars, some nice comments, typical reaction, big interest, but also repulsion. So it's not... There's three big categories of this. First, there's pathologization, pathologization, like borderliners, or pro love gets defined, and polyamorous people don't fit into it. Humans don't know what love is anymore, but Howard knows it. And people get excluded. And from, from this we have hundreds and thousands of, of examples, a lot of the same reactions, interest, hate. My favorite comment is the one of, of Tanya. It says, uh, one man would be enough for me. This is, sounds funny, but I noticed this might be the answer. The most important question is, where does the hate come from, which is the, t the topic of this conference. Why do they, don't they care about their own bed? Why aren't they happy with their conventional 
a relationship, and that's enough. And the answer may be, maybe because a lot of them aren't happy. If you look at these conventional monogamous relationships, statistically, you see uh, bad numbers. Uh, 43 uh, divorces on 100 marriages. Um, affairs are the most likely reason to, to a divorce. Half of people has done an affair. More than half saw their sexual wishes not fulfilled, which is strange, don't you think? I would love to see how this is distributed in here. And maybe turn down the light a bit. Just a little bit, discretion. I give a bit romantic. And then let's just look at this. At Republika, just a short one, just one question. Who of you uh, had an affair in your relationship? In statistic, more than. That is. 10% friends, this can't be quite right. Yeah, we have to say that these studies are anonymous. I, I can understand if your Twitter friend is sitting next to you. Let's do it anonymously. Now, I'm the study leader, and you are just the test persons, and we all close our eyes. Do it, do it, please. Help, help me, please. And now I ask again, hands up, who uh, had an affair in a relationship? Well, that's exactly half as a uh, double as much, thanks. It's, the result is the same every time. We don't really know why, but it's a catastrophe, isn't it? It's a disaster. We think if 90 to 99 percent want to live like this, even though 99 percent educate us in this direction, 99 percent of our stories are built for monogamy by Shakespeare, Walt Disney's right to the big uh, love stories of our time. Got a picture of Twilight here? Oh shit. Minne singing The Stones with to who knows what the corrupt youth of today likes. We learn all the time about love. One plus one equals love. This is not the quite equal uh, calculation. It's kind of religious, religion of love, it's relatively simply. Me, as a person, I have to put power into finding the one big love, and this will be great. But it's worth, like, well, okay, and if we just okay, take it for granted. And Hannelore Gantz said, if we had that many divorces somewhere in air, air technique, uh, airplanes wouldn't exist. Our relationships look like this uh, plane in Hamburg. We don't know. Will it work? Will it? Won't it? Oh, it gets a bit. And in the end, you you barely can get it going again. very unsafe for air technology. I, I, I won't show you a video of a flug, uh, plane crash, idiots. But in Intim Life, Anne Wagner says, this individual um, disaster as a human is very normal, but there's still these big pains and we feel this, that this is not quite right, this is not quite just, this is not, this, we can't meet this ide ideal, we don't really know why, but basically we don't really know enough about sex, uh, because sex is such a shameful topic, because many people talk about it, but nobody tells about it, and if you do, there's just a lot of hate. 
and maybe this, this thing, and this hate, maybe it's the same, maybe the, the not enough of tolerance just is not just a not enough of love, maybe this is just standard story of sexual discrimination, on one hand are the ones who are just want to be accepted, and on the other side are those who don't want to see anything else. Maybe it's time to change something radically, maybe have a sexual revolution 2.0. In this uh, place, there's just one important disclaimer, there's Paul and Jelena. Now, I'm a young, white, heterosexual guy. If I talk about men and women in the first place, it's not because I want to exclude the homosexuals or whatever. It's not about these two genders and you have to fit in. It's just about that men and women are best researched in, their, um, in science. Wer hat da Probleme? Who has problems with that? Someone had problems with that. The first sexual revolution we knew was just the high point in a long transformation of architecture and economics of love and sex. Just liberalisierung und individualisierung westlicher Gesellschaften vor allem. Endlich wurden da BHs verbrannt. In a lot of liberal, liberal, liberalizations in the Western world, people burned their uh, bras. And thousands of people went to the streets to have sex as we wanted. After women have been uh, dictated by others what about sexuality, now we are all allowed to love. And this modern architecture Everything of, of ideology uh, we know since then, one song tells us of 1980. Uh, unfortunately, there was no pina colada here, uh, so that's something that you could improve. So what has improved with the sexual revolution, not just the circumstances, but also my preferences determine uh, what I find. And so how do I love? Who do I want to love? So criteria such as sexiness, attractiveness, market value, gain in importance. Now, this is determined by attributes that and, and uh, common features that you may find. To, uh, but to find out what connects me to someone who needs some introspection, I have to recognize myself, therefore, and, and realize, and then find a counterpart that hopefully will understand my weaknesses and accept them. And then you may find big love. but. Even then, just like a, like a favorite song might get on your nerves at some point. Please turn the sound up. And then perhaps you look for someone new, what is on offer perhaps. And uh, in that case, it might be in the newspaper, in this case in a, a column for people searching like this person who likes pina coladas and does not like certain things. I don't know if you know the song. The punchline is, of course, that this person meets the woman with whom he hopes for something new, and it's, it's his own wife or partner. So this is something that we have today, so-called zero monogamy, and uh, you think, well, was that all? and then you go off and find someone new. But at least since the sexual revolution, we in our unbelievably privileged uh, society are in an unchained market for sexual preferences. But that was not the first sexual revolution. The, as it were, zero, zero th sexual revolution was about 10 to 20,000 years ago. And that was domestication, uh, people settling down, or as it has been called, the worst mistake of 
of humanity. Uh, perhaps this was when monogamy was created, as we know today. Now, this changed from hunters and gatherers to people settling uh, as farmers and, and cattle herders uh, was the largest change of behavior of any species that was ever observed on this planet. The whole social structure, even the anatomy, changed fundamentally, and perhaps, probably also, sexuality. At the time people settled down, they, from, from love, sex, and, and family, they need something else than before. People drew the plow together, literally, and uh, had a certain economic dependency, but a psychological one as well. And then there was social sanctions and social frameworks that were to support this unit. We had something to inherit, something like capitalism came about. If I have something to, to pass on and a, a piece of ground that with hard work I made arable, I want my own children to inherit this and not someone else. And at the same time, I have to look out that my partner doesn't abscond because without that second workforce, I may just starve. Of course, there were polygamous societies at the time, but from our Western perspective, uh, the thing that dominated in the end was the most limited, the poorest, and there are good reasons for that. Uh, monogamous patriarchic systems functioned well in terms of strong societies, strong na nation states that fought about resources. Monogamously living people were easier to pin down. The, the women were bound to the families. Monogamy always was a bloody model, but it made us fly to the moon. So monogamy was the potato of relationship models. Uh, it was very practical. <clears throat> But how was it before, in the good old days, long before, 100, 200,000 years ago, when we were hunters, hunters and gatherers? Nobody has a time machine to flow back. There aren't even images, whether you believe it or not. And could we see what it was like in the case? But there are pieces of evidence, there are hints. First, social structures, groups were very egalitarian, which we can see from natural indigenous, indigenous people that live quite similarly. There was no concept of fatherhood, because without genetic testing, it was hard to prove fatherhood. Everyone looked after everyone's children. On the other hand, there is the accumulative pregnancy concept, which is the woman collects as much sperm as possible from as many talented people as possible, and from that ball a child grows that has all these uh, properties. Uh, that's a bit different to the way we do it today. Of course, surely if there was love, there were intimate uh, dual relationships, but surely there was no holy concept of sexual exclusivity as we know it today. Also, our basic anatomical features are suitable to monogamous life. The sperm competition concept has to be mentioned here, that awful concept. If we consider why we have the sperm selective vaginal environment, I'll stop with the anatomy soon, but. Uh, an environment that selects quite distinctly which sperm is allowed to uh, to impreg impregnate the egg, fertilize the egg. And on the other hand, there is this kind of competition that almost looks like a football team with attacking sperms and defending uh, drops of liquid. And then there are bridge builders that bridge this liquid. And then, and then so that's why we have that. German football team picture here, and with a penis that functions as a vacuum pump. I'm not inventing this. Biology has known this for a long time. This in and out movement can be sucked out with it, and then we have external testicles that make it ready to, to fertilize uh, all the time, quite, quite unique. So moments of last orgasm. You can explain all this with polygamy and it all makes sense only if there is a, another person's sperm and if evolution is a clever concept because the more there is 
And the more people fuck, the more they procreate. That's quite cleverly done by nature. So there are a few effects where you realize this. This was the former American president, U.S. President Coolidge, in the 1910s. He was in office, and with his wife, he visited a, um, a chicken farm, and um, he wondered how much intercourse these chicken had and how many eggs they would produce. And they asked the farmer this. Where, whether it's always one cock with uh, one hen and, and the breeder said to Coolidge's delight, no, everyone has a whole harem of hens available to produce as much as he wants. And he then said, please tell that to my wife a second time because she's quite against that. And since then, we've had the so-called Coolidge effect, which describes that sexuality can be refreshed if you change sexual partners. And you can observe this with almost all species on the planet. And and with that, you have the so-called cycle of love. Research can quite clearly determine that between two and four years, there is a high dopamine adrenaline release, the so-called, well, uh, in love phase, the fireworks, we all know that, hopefully. And then love changes. There is there's more oxytocin. Uh, it's more about intimacy and, and closeness. Love changes. And perhaps from that, you get affairs because you are somewhat programmed by nature to find that, seek that kick again that has the, with that release is, has much in common with the cocaine uh, experience. Scarlett Johansson therefore concluded that monogamy cannot be natural because it's so demanding. You can debate this or uh, ask yourself, what is actually natural for us as humans? This number is natural because humans on the planet is the most dirty species uh, that around. You need about 5,000 cases of intercourse to produce one offspring, and that's the record on the planet. So, and we have the most orgasms. So, if if, if someone says you are at it like animals, that's quite wrong because we are the greatest fuckers. But history says something different. And, this number of people were hanged in in the U.S. at some late point in history for infidelity. So, what is our relationship to nature? We have a lust-friendly nature and have a lust-adverse culture on top of that. So, however our sexuality was constructed, how we live, this does not quite fit. There is something that went wrong here, and there are other areas that where we noticed that we as humans are built differently. We were built to, to run large distances every day, which we never run today, but then we have sport instead. Sexually, we have other tricks on our sleeve. Now, here's a yeah, well, this is the electricity box with which we've all had problems. Could you have a look? Wait. Okay, but why is there this straw in the corner? Well, why are you wearing a mask? Hmm. Well, well, just just uh, give me a blowjob then. This is a famous porn extract that went viral in, in Germany. Um, so one of the famous porn extracts um, with which we find some kind of release. Since 10 or 11 years, we've had new porn, all kinds of freely available movies in Germany. If you didn't know this, no one knows, of course. And uh, we thought that a hypersexualized generation would arise from this. And with that porn example, you can easily see how we cons compensate and try to live our nature because our culture model doesn't quite allow it and how we then find that technology might be a way out and we exaggerate uh, what technology can do and we know how young people react in this technological world and that is not the way we expect it. First sex of young German people still is about 16 years, the first experience still is petting and an important thing for young people is to have the right person. So technology doesn't seem to be influencing us that much, and that applies to online dating as well. Now, this is for the one-year-old Dutch person uh, that didn't get the name in China who was... He had to go into hospital when he had been living at, in the airport for a long time and for exhaustion had to be treated in hospital. Why was he there? Because of this woman, his internet love, Chang, he traveled 8,600 
600 kilometers from Amsterdam, but she considered the whole thing a joke and she was in another city, so he spent 10 days at the airport, didn't reach his target. So maybe he was crazy, maybe he was crazily alone, but uh, his case shows us that we still, even with the internet and transcontinental flights, want to find, with or without online dating, someone. Uh, it doesn't matter how. It's maybe the, maybe the wrong place to say this, but technology does not solve our problems in terms of love and sex. Technology is hugely overrated there. Very different question now. I have talked a huge lot now about from this book, what you know. Who of you knew all this? Who of you, who of you knew 100% of what I've just talked about? One of the interpreters is raising his hand, her hand, their hand. Uh, who knew 60%? You are the avant-garde, not bad. 30%? And the rest? And the rest? Wow. God, what do you do on a Saturday night? What, what do you do on a Saturday night? Well, two years ago, I was at 20, 30% until I started my research. And uh, what, I, what we're talking about is the most important thing in all our lives. And what kind of sexual education do we get? We have condoms being pulled over bananas. And we don't really say how we function up above and down there. and we. So what would we need for a sexual revolution? We need much more education, still more acceptance of these alternatives that I've talked about. We need a lot of self-confidence. We need more certainty in what we do. We have to ask ourselves all over again, what is love, actually? Where is love? This is the heart of which we think that love is located. And uh, Mar Margrethe Stukowski wrote, if we are not free, above, up there. We can't be free up, up there until we are free down there. And, and the other way around, too. And I think up there and down there isn't very easy to separate either. Love, a very intelligent woman once said, is a labyrinth, from a maze from which you have to find your own escape or exit. I think we're still in that maze and looking at our smartphones and not thinking about the eventual outcome, just wondering how strangely complicated the hedges are cut that form this maze. The relationships I talked about at first, they're not so important. They were just an experiment uh, that perhaps tried to get us more closer to our nature, a nature that we have tried to fight with forks and, and uh, pitchforks. And, 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 uh, so this is something you may ask yourself in your mind if you don't dare. How many of you are really happy with the relationships and the sex lives that you have? Uh, of course, everyone have to, has to show up now. You tend to be at Republica without your partner, don't you? But it's not enough. Even if it were 99%, I think it's still not enough. And that in our incredibly privileged Western world, almost everywhere in the world, people are less free than we are and can love less freely as we can and than we can. So I think there is a kind of moral duty here towards those that are not as free to, first of all, make that freedom available to them and then be tolerant towards others and thirdly just live our freedom. Instead, there is still a kind of innovation blockade in love and as a kind of st strong inspiration, if that wasn't enough, you have Coco. Coco has a boyfriend, a st uh, education, uh, she has uh, a flat and she has a ring around her neck, which uh, her boyfriend can use. This is the drawer under the TV with the ropes that Coco is uh, bondaged with and they have those rings in their living room so that they can play as the BDSM scene calls it. And Coco says, I'm his slave, not just in my bed, but 24-7 because that's what I want. Perhaps the freedom, she says, is to submit. Is that the logical freedom that Coco has? Is she allowed to do this as a young, emancipated, strong woman that has all those rights? Is it love or is it sick? Where does my tolerance end? And are we really as free to allow this? I was wondering whether I should use Coco as an illustration for this. There's all kinds of perspectives from which you can say that this is not possible, that this is not right. 
for her to submit in this way. But I think exactly because of that, this is a perfect example. The relationship model of the 24-7 slave can be criticized in many ways, but it challenges us. It makes us reflect, and it shows us what's all possible if we would experiment a bit more, perhaps without a whip. But I would want us to become a bit more cocoa, all of us. I'm a bit hesitant when I'm asked how sexuality and love should change in Germany because I'm not a sexual sexuality advisor and I find it difficult to, to tell people what they should do in bed. So I'll instead talk about myself. The so-called open relationship is not really about sex for me. It's more about being open and adjust the relationship freely as I want it to go to the source code, perhaps, and through the encounter with these people that I've found so impressive because they're strong and they dare things and they fail and they make mistakes and then go back, but at least they leave their comfort zone to change something together. After that, I had zero readiness to uh, make people prescribe to me, culturally or otherwise, what I should do. I want as much openness as possible. I want mutual recognizing and understanding and I want a bigger opportunity to be not in the 43% that get divorced. Love uh, gets penalized uh, nowadays with uh, advertisements where are just naked uh, women, but it's banal, but uh, love isn't luxury. It's the biggest uh, source of our luck, uh, happiness. And yeah, there's some kind of fight, fight and Nobody wants to take uh, some kind of model away from anyone else, but we, we have to look at these alternatives as inspirations and not irritations. And now is the best time for this, even uh, ju just because uh, immigration and the right-wing assholes. Because as Edward Snowden said, in times of hate, love is a revolution. If you want to ask me what happened to Paul and Janina, who met seven years ago, they are not together anymore. But they are best friends, they live together, they are raising the children together with their new partners, and maybe we can learn something from them. Thank you.